I'm Mike Vardy. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. And this is the Productivityist Podcast. Welcome to the Productivities Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and with me on the show this week is my friend and fellow Canadian, Justin Jackson. He is the founder of Mega Maker. He's done a lot of stuff online, the author of Jolt. We're going to talk about that book. We're going to talk about making and modifying. That's the title of this episode. So rather than talk about the uh, the 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 stuff with my own mouth, let's get to the making. And uh, let John do the modifying. He's my editor. He'll be modifying this afterwards. But let's get to the making. Let's make with the podcast now, shall we? Here's my conversation with Justin Jackson on the Productivityist Podcast. Enjoy. I did not have to ask Justin how to pronounce his last name because it's easy. It's Jackson. Justin Jackson's joining <laughs> me on the show today. Justin, thanks for joining me. Hey, Mike. It's great to be here, man. So we met, um, and uh, some people get really like, it's funny, when they listen to the episode podcast, they're like, uh, one of the things is I don't like hearing the stories of how you've met your guests. And I'm like, you know, that's all well and good. But I think it's important to have backstory because that way uh, there's so many podcasts out there that you, you don't know if they have a relationship with the person or not. And some people I've had on my show I've not really known before. And we've just kind of caught up either in the, you know, kind of the the exploratory call or whatever. But I've known you for a few years now. We The first time we met, even though we're both Canadian, was at, in, in, in the United States at a conference where we <laughs> both spoke um, about – making sausage oh no wait making <laughs> <laughs> how the podcast sausage is made with chase and and schecter and that yeah that was awesome we yeah. had a good time with that yeah we're we live in the same province but i mean to canada fair, yeah. is very big it is and and you're you're essentially on a different landmass <laughs> i am no not, not essentially i actually am <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i'm like way in the interior so you probably get the same thing i do which is when people say, I say, oh, I'm in British Columbia, they go, oh, Vancouver? I'm like, well, no, I'm way in the interior. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm in the, yeah, I'm the closer to Vancouver. woods. Yeah, I'm closer to Vancouver than you are. Yeah, well, maybe not with all the ferry rides and everything. I don't know. How long does it take for you to get from Vernon to Vancouver? <laughs> uh, probably uh, three, four hours. Okay, so it's close. It takes me with the ferry. It takes 95 minutes to get from Victoria. Yeah, we're probably, you're probably only an hour difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're definitely closer. I'm closer. Of- I could hop on a plane and be there in 20. So <laughs> mind you, I could hop on a plane and be in Seattle in 22. So it's the nice thing about where I live is that it's in that like the trinity of the Pacific Northwest or the quadrilateral <laughs> if you throw Portland in there, where it's like Vancouver, Victoria, Seattle, Portland, like we're all kind of in the same vicinity. And it's not yeah. tough for you to get around where you are really either. You're, you're not too far in. Yeah, I mean, it's always a little bit of a hop to get out of here. Like I, I'm in the Okanagan and... Yeah, so you always go to Seattle first, usually. But mm-hmm. yeah, the it's I like where I live, and so I'm willing to have the pain of you know one extra transfer or whatever. So uh, we now uh, have shared people how we met, but can you tell my audience a little bit about you before we dive into the ideas that I want to talk about? Which is today we're going to talk about making largely. Sure, yeah, for sure. Um, I in 2008 I switched careers. I was in the nonprofit, not business, but I was working for nonprofits for years and years and years. And then I um, decided I wanted to get into software. And so in 2008 I started kind of ground level in a software company and worked my way up to product manager. And then uh, two or three years ago I decided I wanted to do something different. 
And I did some consulting with startups in Portland, San Francisco, Colorado, London, and uh, did that for a year and a half. And then this past January, um, even though I've always had a side hustle, I've always been working on side projects, I decided I was going to go independent. So no, uh, no big consulting client, no job, just me trying to make stuff and trying to make a living. And so I, I just finished um, my first year of being solo. Wow. And, and I mean, as someone who went solo oh, a number of years ago now, it's starting to be hard for me to figure out like when. So it's six years. I kind of equate it to how old my son is, um, <laughs> you know, where I was doing it completely as my full-time job. It's not mm. an easy decision to make in terms of the like all the other things that it impacts, but it's yeah. a rather easy decision to make when you look inward, I would think, in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, I've been waiting. I mean, the the story I tell is, I've been into, well, specifically having my own business my whole life. I had little businesses when I was in high school, in college. I quit my job at a hotel and started a little video production company. Um, and then what changed was uh, my wife and I got married. And then at 22 years old, we had our first child. And at the time, I had a business. I had a, two retail businesses and it just did not go well. <laughs> mm. And and so once we, you know, cleaned all that up, which was probably one of the most horrible experiences of our lives, my wife said, Justin, can we just wait until all of our kids are in school before you go out and try to do this again? <laughs> and um, I said, yeah. So we ended up having three more kids. We've got four total. And our youngest last year um, was his first year in grade one. So it was a good time to transition from consulting into just being solo. So that was part of it was I've, I've been just chomping at the bit to get out and, and do this again. Uh, and now I'm in it. And it's like scary as hell. But I, you know, that was like the, that was the, you know, the fire in me is like, yeah, I got to get out and I got to, do my own thing again. And, um, there's a lot of it that I just love. Like it's going to be, I, I'm not opposed to going back to work if I need to, but I, you know, there's a lot I would miss. Let's talk about making stuff. Cause that's one of the big th reasons that I want to talk to you today is you are a, a serial maker, I would say. <laughs> um, one of the things I've struggled with is the idea of when to make and when to modify. So in other words, we were talking about this before we jumped on the show, is that, you know, the idea of, hey, I've got all the stuff I've already made. How do I modify it so that way I can use it for some other purpose? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, first off, I want to talk about like the idea of what making means to you and because mm -hmm. you've got Mega Maker and all that other stuff. And there's gonna be a ton mm -hmm. of show notes on this. But also when when do you look at something that you've made and say, OK, how do I modify this and make something completely new? Mm -hmm. Well, this past year was a good kind of case study in this because I had all this pent up creative energy, right? And so, and I turned uh, 36 last year too. So, so I was just, so you're young and I well, yeah, but <laughs> I, I was all, I was just feeling like you know I've been waiting 14 years for this, and so I was just like ah, I can't wait, and then I just set off. And the initial idea behind Mega Maker, which is my podcast, was I'm going to make a hundred things in a year. And so for the first six months, all I did was explore and be creative and create tons and tons of things. I, I'm usually just making digital things like software or plugins, uh, book, ebooks, courses, things like that. And I even experimented with physical items this time, you know, like T-shirts and merch and all sorts of other things. But six months in, June 2016, I realized like, whoa, I haven't made any money. And that was like this huge kind of like, okay, I got to stop making so much stuff and I got to focus on what's going to work. And so that month, I just like quit doing everything else 
and I wrote Jolt, which is my newest book. I wrote it in a month because I needed the money. And, um, you know, th- ever since that moment, I've realized if you're going to be solo, whether you're doing consulting work or making things, you need a pipeline of products that people will pay for. And so um, I still think it's good to make things I, and make a lot of things, actually. I think that's how you get better. But there's this balance. And the balance I figured out was I need to have way less exploration than I was doing and way more just like executing on what actually matters. And usually the stuff you, you know, the stuff that matters is what's already working. Right. You know, so I was like trying to expand my audience. I thought, okay, I'm going to, you know, typically my audience was product people, you know, people who were uh, making software, making digital products. And I thought, I'm going to expand. I'm going to get into artists and musicians and painters. And what I figured out in that six months of exploration, was like, you know what? You know who actually, who my customers are? Software developers, designers, product people. Those are the people. And not much changed. And so I went back to what was already working and, you know, wrote Jolt. And then the next month I relaunched talking about modifying. I relaunched Marketing for Developers, which was a book with some videos just as a course. So I recreated it as an online course. You can still find copies of the book floating around, but I, I'm really emphasizing this self-paced course that you can take now. And both of those moves uh, were, I mean, they basically, they, they're what saved me financially. You know, they that's that's when I realized, oh yeah, this is a business and, you know, I need to focus on what matters. So let's, let's talk about what you recommend to people. And I know Joel, Joel's a great book, by the way, I've I've got it linked in the show notes. I, I, I inhaled it on a plane (laughs) ride back from, I think it was coming back from San Francisco. And it's, it's just, it's, what I loved is that there's so much actionable stuff behind it. You know, like you finish up every chapter and there's something that you should do. And, and it's, you know, I don't, I have the digital, the digital version, obviously. So it's, 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 it's not dog eared, but man, mm-hmm. like, you know, the little bookmarks you can put on iBooks. Like, it's just like, yeah. Oh, look, there's 50 million of these, uh, <laughs> these little things in there. But oh, thank you. No, it, it's, it's, it's so good. In fact, I think I, I bought one for someone that, uh, locally here uh, where I, w- I was having coffee with her. I think I told you this. And, yeah. uh, and she's like, uh, you know, I need, I said, you need this book. And I, I bought it for her and, and she's like, this is great. Like it gives me everything I need to kind of mm-hmm. move forward. But the thing you don't need, and you wrote about this recently is, uh, as we're recording, this is a mind gremlins. And I think that's what gets mm-hmm. in a lot of people's way. Uh, Pressfield might call it the resistance, but you're getting a bit more specific with it. So mm-hmm. how do you, and obviously you came across these during the, your, your journey to kind mm-hmm. of getting to where you're at now. We all have. How, do you, how have you managed to keep them at bay more often than not? Well, I mean, I'm just as – I'm just uh, the same as everybody else. Yeah, we all fall <laughs> victim to it. There's no mistake. But how do you, what are some strategies that you've used that have kind of said, okay – um, let's make sure yeah. that, you know, let's make sure that, that, that these don't win. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing is, and this is a trick I learned, I I'm really extroverted, but I used to be super shy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I would go to a party and I would just feel like, Oh, I feel so shy. I feel like everyone's talking and I'm not. And one thing I realized is man, this is all about me. Like I'm just sitting in this corner, sipping on my drink, completely obsessed with myself. And the way I got out of my shyness was I said, I'm just going to make this whole experience about other people. So taking the focus off of me and focusing on other people. And that's one way I've been able to get over mind gremlins. As soon as I start thinking about me and my own anxiety, I just try to think about the people I'm trying to help. and it's often by name, you know, like, oh man, if, if Janet in Iowa could get this, this would really help her and her business out. And, um, this is something I'm, I'm about to launch something that the other way you get out of the mind gremlins is you, you keep going back to what's working. Mm. So my, my two most 
like popular products are marketing for developers uh, and Jolt. Yep. And what did people like about them? They liked these actionable uh, tactics, ideas, tricks. When I do, uh, I do these coaching calls, and when people like reply after about what was helpful, they're like, "Oh my gosh, you just shared me all these little tricks that I never knew before." And so, uh, I'm working on this subscription service called Tiny Marketing Wins. Right. And by the time this is out, it'll be out there for everybody. Yeah. It's it's hopefully going to launch on February 1st. But you know, the other way I get over those mind gremlins is I'm like, I know that this kind of stuff has helped people in the past. And so I can get over this anxiety by thinking, you know what, this is likely going to help people again in the future with something new. And, um, kind of both of those things in tandem, like, okay, I've seen this work before, calm down. It, it's it's going to be okay. And then also, um, just quit focusing on yourself. Just focus on who you're trying to help. You know, one thing that I did, I, I wish I'd done this earlier. I, it's what I advise everybody to do is I'm working away on this tiny marketing wins thing. And I've got lots of, you know, qualitative data to say, this is the right thing to work on because I've have all these consulting calls. I've got all these, you know, emails and customers who have done other things, but I'm like, I haven't talked to the people on this waiting list yet. Like I haven't, I've been talking to them, but I haven't asked them where they're at. And so I send out a survey, uh, that just says, okay, tell me, what did I ask? I said, you know, where are you right now? What, what are you working on? Um, what's, where do you want to go? Like what, what's kind of, where are some of the, what are some of the things you want to achieve this year? Um, what else did I say? What, what does your product, how does your product make customers more awesome? What's been your biggest struggle with marketing this year? What part of your marketing setup gives you the most anxiety? Questions like that. And just getting those responses back, like, again, taking the focus off me and focusing on the real human beings with real names and real lives who have, you know, through some serendipity ended up on this list. It's night and day. Like I reworked the entire first module of Tiny Marketing Wins just based on that feedback. So yeah, those those things have been helpful. <laughs> but I should say like there's days I drink, if I drink like too many cups of coffee, my brain, like I'll stay up all night just worrying about st- worrying about stuff. So I'm I'm a human being too, but when I'm in the right headspace, those things work. What are you ready to kill of all the stuff that's out there? Whatever you can say. Like there's got to be I mean you look at your product yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I mean that's mm-hmm. the thing is is <clears throat> when you've got so many things that might be pulling at you and this is a struggle that I've I've had is mm-hmm. you know, I mean with the night owl stuff, which is great. Uh, mm-hmm. And people identify like, oh, Mike's the guy who is a productive person, but he generally focuses on night stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's, you know, obviously there's a need for email stuff, which I've been working on and things like that. But there's stuff that like we had a product called Meeting Makeover. And it's a product that, that you know, we we like, but we haven't really pushed it. And I don't know if we want to spend time pushing it. So do you just kill it? Like where, mm-hmm. like, ha- like, do you have anything out there? Like, I mean, again, looking at all your projects, which of course are mm-hmm. on and products that are on the page, you've got, you know, are you, th- are there things that, you know, like software mm-hmm. stuff and things like that? Are you going to kill stuff or are you just going to let it maybe hibernate or incubate? Like, how do you, yeah. how do you deal with that? Yeah. Like some things I let go to the back burner. So, mm-hmm. um, what's a good example? Um, well, right now my podcast, Mega Maker is on the back burner. And I, I, I had initially told people I'd be back in January making new episodes, but I've made this whole month just about finishing tiny marketing wins and, uh, doing a lot of stuff on YouTube, uh, because it lends itself naturally to promoting tiny marketing wins. Right. And so there's no space, there's no room for, um, doing a podcast, especially one one a week. So I've been fine with just saying, you know what, I'll get back to that when I can. Uh, in a lot of ways, this shift, like I killed a big part of Mega Maker, mm-hmm. which was this idea of like, okay, this is for everybody that likes to make stuff, whether you're an artist, a musician. Now it's the, the tagline I think is for people who want to earn an independent income from things they create. 
and it's specifically around uh, digital product makers, right? And it, a lot of it is just a journal of my life. So that was a big shift. And um, this year, I didn't start another make a hundred things challenge. I'm not doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, not pushing Mega Maker apparel as much, um, but whenever I push it, it sells and it's great. It's fun, but yeah. So I, I'm I'm more of a back burner guy. Uh, I sold one of uh, a WordPress plugin I'd done with a, a partner. I just sold my half to him. And so that's off my plate now. Um, so I, I'm getting a little bit better at that, but a lot of times it's hard it's, to rec- it's hard to reconcile when you're it really is because you mm-hmm. I mean, like I said before, like I was going through all my old blog posts and it's funny, the kernels of what I have developed over the years started in 2010, if not earlier, uh, mm-hmm. at least chronicled or that. And so you're like, Oh, um, I should go back and modify that and make it better. Um, and make it more relevant. But then, and the other thing is, is then you're like, okay, but then I have to go and make sure that this looks like this and this works like this. And it becomes this, this, um, it's almost like this never ending cycle of modification or at least a a longer term. Whereas you, and my default is to go, why don't I just go make something new? Yeah. Yeah. So I've taken a hybrid approach. So like, uh, tiny marketing wins definitely has, um, tactics from, you know, things I've explained on my blog, things I've explained in marketing for developers, things I've explained in Jolt, but it's like version two of all those things. So I can take, you know, that research that I've already done. Mm -hmm. I can take what I've learned since then and I can update it. And my theory with tiny marketing wins is, you know, I'm going to keep making one of these, uh, I'm going to release a new win every week forever. <laughs> yep. And, and, but you know, a, a lot of it will be going back and saying, okay, this used to work. For example, uh, Twitter lead gen cards used to be a really great way to get email subscribers. You could, it was, uh, a little link you could put in a tweet and it was a one click subscribe. Well, Twitter is getting rid of those. So that was a tactic, a little trick I was, uh, recommending to people to yep. build up their email list. Okay. Well now that's gone. What can we replace it with? What what other opportunities are out there? And so, like one trick I'm giving people right now is uh, in Medium, you can use a, a service called Upscribe to embed a subscription form in your Medium articles, and it links to your existing email service provider. So that's another that's a little trick you can use right now to get more email subscribers, and maybe it'll replace what you were getting through Twitter cards. You know right. what I mean? Yep. So the, that's kind of the idea is using some of that old stuff, going back and going, okay, you, you know, I, a lot of the videos are me refreshing ideas that I've explained before, but now I've got a better way of of illustrating it, you know? Um, I've got this great framework I'm using for teaching people how to write effective landing page copy, which is to say every landing page should answer these questions. Who is this for and where are they now, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, this is for uh, podcasters and they're starting a new podcast. Okay, what's their dream of a better life? Like, how do they want their life to be better? Well, they dream of having a show that gets 5,000 downloads a month. Okay, great. Now, what stands in their way? What obstacles are in the middle? Well, <laughs> podcast hosting is hard. Uh, finding a place to put your MP3s is hard. Formatting the RSS feed is hard. Submitting it to iTunes is hard. And the hardest is how do you get listeners? Okay, so those are all the, all the obstacles. So if I have an application or any sort of product for podcasters, I need to be able to communicate, this is for you, the new podcaster. Imagine having 5,000 downloads a month But man, isn't it hard? It's like you have to deal with all this stuff. Well, this thing I'm offering you helps you overcome those obstacles and get to that dream of a better life, right? Mm -hmm. And I just explained that now, probably the clearest I've ever explained it. And it's because I've been practicing and updating that, you know, for whatever, eight years or something like that. So I think we build on the stuff that we've done in the past. I've also been like taking old blog posts 
And um, a lot of people never update their old blog posts. I, I do it all the time. I go back and I update them. Sometimes I'll put a new a new date on them, um, and I'll re I'll cross post them to Medium. You know, I I like refreshing that old stuff because it, it's like building on what you've done in the past and going, oh yeah, but I've grown so much and oh that was wrong or you know. And it's also, also- kind of cool to see what you were thinking back then and see that wow that is. I'm still on that wavelength to a certain extent, but I'm yeah. I've grown. Like, I mean, because there's, there's things that I look back at 2000. I'm like, Oh crap, this became time theming or this became like the thing that I'm doing now. And it's just like, it, it's really, you know, again, it's, it's, it's validating. Right. Yeah, totally. I, I, that's so funny. How many times I have gone back or even like old tweets, like just go yep. and look at your old tweets and be like, man, I was talking about that back then. That's crazy. Yep. You know? Yep. But the truth is like people, if you're offering something to people, whether it doesn't matter who it is, if you're trying to sell something to your boss or sell something to a customer or, you know, create an audience, build an audience, grow an audience, people do want new stuff. So the key is you have to make these old themes, these kind of universal truths, fresh, exciting, surprising. And so you go back to the old material and you go, okay, this is still true. <laughs> like <laughs> like one of the, the things about product marketing, the, the, the dirty secret about product marketing is that building a product that people want is 90% of the battle, yep. <laughs> right? You create a product people want and the marketing is like the 10% of, it's like the fuel you put on the fire. Right. But if there's no flame... If it's not already something people are attracted to, you know, something that people are coming up to to get warm, uh, it's going to be really hard to, you know, make that grow. And so I have to keep repeating that, but I have to keep thinking of unique ways to repeat it, you know? Yep. And, uh, but it's still, you know, it's still the same truth. No, totally, totally. And, and, and I mean, there's so much more we could dive into this, but... I definitely want to talk about the idea of how you learn about this stuff. And and we're going to get into that, but not, not in this episode. If you're a Patreon supporter, um, it's one of the bonus episodes either coming up or if depending on when you're listening to this or it's already out there. So if you're a Patreon supporter, head over to patreon.com slash productivityist, support the show, unless you're already supporting the show, in which case you should be able to find it pretty easily. Justin, this has been great. Uh, we could talk and, and we have talked in the past for, for <laughs> long periods of time, both vocally and through Facebook chat and stuff, but I want to, yeah. uh, I want to make sure that people get to where they need to be. So let's talk about where they can go um, and where you want them to go to learn more about you. And maybe even a little bit about tiny marketing wins. Cause by the time this, this episode is being listened to, it should be out there in the wild. Cause it's not going to be, fe- this is coming out later than February. So if it's yeah. not out there by then, by the time this airs, which is basically people should be listening to this as early as April, uh, no mm-hmm. earlier, uh, then, then they should be able to get access to it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, you can Google tiny marketing wins and it'll be the first result. Um, I, the, the thing I'm working on right now a lot is my YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash Justin Jackson, that'll take you to my channel. And I am more than happy to like get your feedback on that. Tell me what you like, what you don't like. And my aim is to get to a thousand subscribers. And I think I'm at almost 600. So if you want to go there and give me a subscribe and watch some of my videos, that'd be awesome. And then everywhere else, I'm like on Twitter, I'm the letter M, the letter I, Justin, M I, Justin. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Justin, for joining me this week on the Productivity Podcast. Yeah, man, this has been fun. Big thanks to Justin for joining me this week on the show. You can check out the show notes at the Productivityist website. Go to productivityist.com slash podcast. You'll be able to slash podcast, yes. And you'll be able to see all of the shows that we've had. And uh, of course, you can also check out the show notes on iTunes or wherever you are listening to this podcast. In fact, if you are using iTunes or someplace else where you can rate and review the show, I would really appreciate it. Let the people know out there what you think of the show, good or bad or whatever. Um, I'd rather have that than indifferent because it'll help me make the show better. 
Uh, big thanks to John Polster for producing the show. Big thanks to uh, my team for putting together the show notes and getting things up and running, especially while I was away. A, a slew of recent episodes went up, and they all went up without me here. I was traveling, and they all went up. And again, can't thank enough uh, my team for uh, making sure that these things went up without a hitch. And uh, that's it. We're going to uh, hitch our way out of here, hitch a ride to next week's episode. And remember, if you want to get more content from me, if you want to get more podcast episodes, I do two bonus episodes every single week for my Patreon supporters who also get other things, including an exclusive membership to a Slack community where we can talk about productivity methodologies and practices and apps and all that fun stuff. There's some really cool conversations going on about apps in there uh, recently where we talk about different apps we might want to use and stuff. And I'm, I'm, kind of dipping my toe in some apps that people are suggesting. So if you want to do that, head over to patreon.com slash productivity so you can check out all the perks that are available for as little as a dollar a month. You can support the show and be part of that community. So check it out again, patreon.com slash productivity. That's it for this week. Until next time, I am Mike Barty, the host of the Productivities podcast and founder of Productivityist, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. <laughs>